Let's move on, though, to group chat and the whole reason you're here, Chris Velasco. We're going to talk about iPads. iPads. I, well, iPad singular. There iPad. Is, there is just one new iPad. Yes. It's not the most exciting iPad. It is not. But it is, if nothing else, an iPad. And it's probably going to do really well <laughs> just because of that. Well, I mean, it's not like the bar uh, for is really low there. Like, it's not like we've ever seen, like, a super underperforming iPad. Yeah. Apple makes an iPad, it sells a shit ton of them. Exactly. And it always does. And, like, that has caused some level of consternation in, like, the Apple fan community because this is one of the few times Apple has really kind of conceded and built something that very much feels like a mass market device. Like, hey, it starts at 329 it's a little thicker, like, you can kind of tell they made compromises to get this thing's price point down to where it is. And some people are interpreting this as a race to the bottom, is a phrase that I've seen several times. And I'm just like, guys... Ta like iPad sales aren't great, tablet sales aren't great. Like they, they need to make some money. They're still gonna make good iPads. Yeah. This isn't a bad thing. Like what is the problem? There's room in the market for a premium product and like a mainstream product, yeah. right? I'd also say there's room in the market for like an unabashedly good, inexpensive tablet. And I gotta tell you, when I was writing a review, which by the time you see this has been published already, I have not like I struggled so hard to come up with like alternatives you could go for in that price range. Like the Galaxy Tab S2 was pretty good, but it is fairly old at this point. You could do an S3, but that's going to be probably twice as much as this iPad is going to cost. Like all of the really high performing stuff that that feels on some level on par with this mm -hmm. cheapo iPad is 100, 200 bucks more expensive. Like that's kind of a big deal for Apple. I guess part of the question here for me is, you know, they've made this mass market device. But in general, tablet sales have been slipping. Is this going to be enough to kind of bring... And iPad has not been immune to that. Right. Apple has... Certainly not. Uh, their sales have at least plateaued, if not started to drop a little bit. I think we've seen them... iPad sales have dipped... Not with, as much as the rest of the market. Right, but with, with, to some, an alarming degree of like regularity over the past few quarters. Like, yeah. it's, it's kind of a thing. So is this going to be the sort of thing that can kind of at least stem the bleeding, if not uh, cause sales to tick back up, do you think? I think in the short term, it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be a positive for a while, if only because think of all the people who bought into the original iPad, they bought into the iPad 2, like they have these old devices and you know what, like they still mostly work, like you can still use them to read and gadget or whatever, like they're still mostly functional things. It's just that iOS as a platform has grown by leaps and bounds since those days. So a lot of the people out there are working with, in a lot of ways, a degraded experience. So by, by being able to offer this very clear upgrade path, like, hey, if you've got an old, ancient iPad that is starting to not work so great, yeah, here, here's the thing for $300 that's actually really quite good. It's got an iPhone 6S's brain. It has the screen, more or less, uh, from the iPad Air 2, just not laminated, so it's not quite as thin. It's not, it's not like the iPad Air 3, like a lot of us wanted or expected, but it's a very good machine, and it's a very clear path for people who on some level have been left behind by Apple. Do either of you still actually use a tablet? Oh my God, yeah. Dana? No. No, okay. Um, but did you ever? I did, um, I did briefly, I gave it my best shot. Mm -hmm. um, I've sort of reverted to my old, old ways. Um, I mean, the app that I liked best when I was using a tablet were digital magazines. Mm -hmm. um, we had one of those. Yeah, we did. Which I it came comes in really handy for business trips, which I don't even take many of anymore. But um, <laughs> I, I still have a romance with my paper magazines. And sure. Otherwise, my phone is is great for what I need it to do. Well, I feel like that's kind of the issue Apple has had to kind of wrap its head around. Like, big phones are a thing. Yeah. They, in a lot of ways, supplanted small tablets. So. I, I would be shocked if we saw another iPad mini after this one. So yeah. we're still working with like the Mini 4 that came out like a year-ish, maybe two ago. Uh, so that's, I feel like that's probably going to go the way of the iPad Air 2 and just sort of get cut completely because, I mean, if you want that big but not huge screen, just get like an iPhone 7 Plus, you've got one device that covers all your bases. Yep. But I still, like, I, more often than not, I commute in on a train to the office and in situations like that, where like holding a phone for like an hour, hour and a half gets a little, a little tedious, and I really don't want to pull out my laptop and like fire up a hotspot to just like bang out emails and stuff. Like situations like that, a, a full size 9.7 inch iPad or 
insert tablet here is perfect. Like I'd rather just sit there and read what I'm going to read and I'd still have the flexibility to like swipe open and open the window and like bang off an email or a text message. Like it's phenomenally helpful for me at least. I guess, I don't know, I, I abandoned the tablets kind of uh, when the smaller tablets died, like as we got bigger phones. I had a Nexus 7 that I loved um, and mm -hmm. as that got a little bit long in the tooth, I had the Nexus 9, uh, our review unit for a while, oh, which is boy. hot garbage. Nexus 9. That thing was... I think that was the first uh, like big review I did here. Possibly. It, I was, not, it was not great. No, it wasn't it was, a great foot to start off on. It is, it was not, it's not a great device. <laughs> um, but what I kind of realized is, I'm like you, Dana, I missed the magazines, which is mostly what I use my Nexus 7 for. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say, I pay for digital magazine subscriptions that I straight up just don't read, which is really dumb. Like, I have a subscription to Wired and GQ, and I don't read either of them because I don't have anything that's really, like, enjoyable to enjoy the design on anymore. Do you so. remember we talked about digital cleansing a few Yeah, I should really cancel back. those. You, you might be time for you to do some sort of audit and just, like... Yeah, no, no. Find it's, it's, all the stuff that you're still <laughs> paying for. That you I think those are, those are two that I can probably pretty safely cancel. I'm sure I haven't read a, an issue of either of those in at least six months. But I mean, I paid for the year, so <laughs> 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 might as well just let it ride out at this point. Um, that's like the only thing, though, that like holds any appeal for me on a tablet. Like, I don't know. I can do most of the stuff from a phone. Yeah, and, and that will continue to be the, the case for most people, but having the option where you could fairly inexpensively like move up into this thing that, I don't know, for some people very ably bridges the gap between yeah. phone and more dedicated machine. Like I, I, I've definitely been able to spend entire, like not fully, like vacation weeks where I would just like leave my laptop at home and just have an iPad and, and get really everything I needed to get done. So yeah. I don't think, the, the capability of these devices is not really in question. It's just the the larger sort of context in which they fit like isn't there for a lot of people. Yeah. But by giving people this this cheapo option that works pretty well, I think Apple's doing a really good job of capturing anyone who feels like they do have that context in their lives somewhere. Well, I think that's actually probably one of the strongest things going for it is you know I think part of the reason the market kind of tanked for tablets probably is with the death of the smaller form factor, mm -hmm. uh, prices for obvious reasons went up. Right. And a $200 Nexus 7 is a much easier sell than a $600 uh, 10-inch iPad. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's a much different investment of money. It's a much easier thing to just say, hey, this one's like, it's not like an impulse purchase, but you're not gonna like have to talk it over with your significant yeah, other before dropping any money still on it. It's <laughs> more of an impulse purchase. Like you could feel a lot better about, I mean, maybe not better, but. 329 is a, still a lot of money to drop. Yeah, but uh, I mean, compared to some of the other options out there, I mean, the, the thing that a lot of iPad nerds are really kind of upset about is because in order to get that really slim, sleek design that we got with the Air 2, you have to now pay extra money for an iPad Pro. Like you have to go with a 9.7 inch iPad Pro. Like there isn't a clear jump up for them. And like, I get it, that really sucks. Like, I'm sorry guys, but like companies like Samsung have jumped on this too. Like you could get last year's or two years ago, I think now, the Galaxy Tab S2, which is a fine tablet, or now the Tab S3, which is a great tablet that costs $600. Like yeah. tablets have assumed now since we've seen the market for lower end and smaller ones kind of fall off a bit. They've moved up into this sort of like prestige class where you feel like that's where you have to compete. And that's gonna be really difficult for a lot of people to, to sort of like throw money at. Um, I know that you talked a little bit about how it's thicker and all of that. And that's yeah. been one of the sort of the complaints about it, it seems. But it did allow them to stick a bigger battery in it though, it right? It did, it did. So that is the, the biggest upshot. And to be clear, it not only has a bigger battery than the iPad Air 2, which was really small, like it was 27 watt hours. It was less than ideal. It was, it's actually even bigger than the original iPad Air, which is the body this thing is modeled on. So it's actually better than the thing that, than what we got like, God, four, five years ago? I have no idea. I mean, it's, Time it should, means nothing. Exactly, it shouldn't <laughs> be surprised that this battery is better, but there are some upsides to it. So to so all those people out there chanting thinner is better, like, Come on, dial it down a little bit. Like, yeah. there's there's reasons this works okay. I would I would gladly sacrifice a few millimeters just to like get a couple of extra hours of battery life. Yeah, I've said that for a really long time, mostly with regard to phones, and I didn't really see that coming with this iPad. But yeah, really pleasant surprise. Like, it's not any more difficult or more 
like onerous to hold for an hour while you're reading a book. Like, yeah. It's fine, guys, relax. And so many of you people out there survived with the original iPad Air for which, so yeah, which weighed long. Like five pounds. You thought it was like a marvel of engineering at the time. <laughs> Maybe you should kind of chill out it's a little bit. It's not actually five pounds. Please don't call me <laughs> out on that. Um, we are running out of time, though. So it is time to get to the wind down. Mm. And, you know, suggest the readers, viewers, listeners kind of go check out a thing. Watch a thing, listen to a thing, read a thing. Do a thing. Are you, are you asking me to start because you're looking at me I'm right looking now? at you. Do you, ha- do you have something to recommend? I do, I I do have a thing. And it's really, so there's a bit of a backstory involved with this. So I went to Mobile World Congress two years ago. And I don't know that this is actually a sanctioned thing, but I do this, like, take a book, leave a book thing. Because you get lots of people from different locales kind of rolling in and leaving their stuff behind. So I left some lousy, I think it was, it wasn't lousy, it was like a Raymond Chandler novel, but like not one of his great ones. And I took this book off the shelf called The Dark Side of Love by Rafiq Shami. It's originally uh, a German novel that was translated into English a few years back. And it's just, it's not my usual thing, but it's just fascinating. Like it, it chronicles the intertwining lives of two prestigious Middle Eastern families. And like on the outside, it feels like this Romeo and Juliet thing, but oh, there's like a murder mystery. Some guy's body was found in a basket above a cathedral. And then you jump back like 40 years to figure out like, oh, well, the clans start off as like feuding goat herders and stuff. Like it's frankly incredible. It feels like six books in one. I'm like halfway through it. I've been reading this thing for like two years. Uh, so if you have <laughs> if you have time in your life to invest, like I feel like this is really is worth it a it. really long book? It's yeah, it's it's like Bible size. Okay. Oh God. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's gonna be uh, if I pick it up, it's gonna be like um, Wilderness Warrior, which I think I'm three quarters of the way through, seven years what, in. What is Wilderness Warrior? It's a biography of uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, okay. Well, I'm in for that, actually. It's super interesting, but it's just, like, really dense. It's, like, 900 pages. It's, like, the <laughs> tiniest of type. It's also, like, I have it in hardcover, so it's impossible oh, to yeah. carry around with you. I chip away at it. Um, before we get to Dana, because she's kind of got the big one for the week, as she's going to have every week for the wind down, because we, she's getting homework assignments, uh, I'm going to recommend that people go listen to the new Mount Erie album, A Crow Looked at Me. Um, if you're not familiar with Mount Erie, the it's uh, musician. His name is uh, why is it escaping me for the moment? Uh, Phil Elverum. He's his former band was the Microphones, who were also awesome. Um, but the new album, I- the new Manieri album, is really beautiful, really depressing. Um, so I would make sure that you are by yourself or don't have anything important to do when you give a listen to it. Uh, it's all about the death of his wife. God. So it's super heavy. Um, I put it on this morning without really thinking about it and like legitimately started welling up with tears while listening to it at my desk. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> I, did, I don't mean to laugh at your pain, but did you, was this morning the first time you listened to this album? It was. <laughs> <laughs> I, had been, I, had kn- I knew that it was going to be like a heavy thing and I'd kind of been like, I don't know if I can do it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm like, I really should need, should need to want, like watch this or listen to it. And I'm like, God, it's going to be really heavy, though. And I don't know have it, if I have it in me. So I just put the Migos album on again. <laughs> it's like my solution. Just, I'll listen to T-shirt on repeat and be a happy man. Uh, so I finally put it on this morning. And it is every bit as good as everybody says it is. It's a really gorgeous album. Uh, but it is really super, super depressing. Uh, the second track is all about um, him bringing his one-year-old child to the site where they were going to build their house and spreading her ashes. Yeah, I it's like, like, I can't even listen to it's, this right it's now. It's rough. Um, but yeah, really beautiful album. You should definitely check it out, uh, especially if you like feeling miserable <laughs> and depressed. I live in New Jersey, so like I choose that state for myself anyway. Yeah. So. It's so perfect. <laughs> Done. Dana, though. Yeah. You did your homework this week. I did. You watched Jaws. I should have done it sooner. You should have. You watched Jaws last night. Yes. Live tweeted Jaws last night. Yes. Which also made me super happy. Um, it was a scary movie. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody should, by the way, go read Dana's um, tweet 17 storm. part yeah. tweet storm. Which is spectacular. <laughs> um, but let's, let's start. What did you think of the movie? I liked it a lot. And... Um, I liked it more than I thought I would. I mean, I never thought Jaws would be my kind of movie. Um, I liked it a lot, and Devendra, who's not here, had um, warned me against watching it after Jurassic Park, as if to say that I'd be let down 
and wouldn't like Jaws as much. But I feel Disagree. the opposite. Um, this was a, a better movie for I Spielberg agree. than Jurassic Park. I know I call Jurassic Park generic and you got mad. Yes, because it's not generic. It's a very good movie. But Jaws is objectively and subjectively a much better film. It was, yeah. I mean... Um, Personally, I'd probably argue that it's his best film. And St- Spielberg has a long and one list of, his of first. very good movies. Yeah. I've never seen Jaws or probably most Spielberg. Like, I've never seen E.T. That was Spielberg, right? Yeah. What? What? Never seen E.T.? No. Can, can you uh, give him homework for I think I've, 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 think I've seen maybe half of, like, an Indiana Jones. Can he get some homework? Why does he Yeah, have... what? What? <laughs> well, I feel like your homework to me is to, to listen to more Bruce Springsteen. That's, I mean, that's my homework to you <laughs> literally every no, day. No, I think E.T. takes priority and Indiana Jones. Uh, I don't agree with you on that one for so many reasons. I heard uh, Crystal Skull's pretty good. God, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where I should, because I guess I should go in reverse chronological order, right? I mean, they will get progressively better. I mean, no, there's... actually, they won't, because Temple of Doom is pretty bad, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so what surprised me about Jaws, though, is I know that it was made 42 years ago. And God, it hasn't so been that long. So these animatronic sharks, which I read, m- were mostly malfunctioning during production, which is partly why Spielberg didn't show the sharks, but I think that made for a more suspenseful movie. Um, but when, when the animatronic sharks did rear their heads, they're still scary. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's... They're old and low-tech, but I mean, I mean, you can't hear it on Twitter. I, you, I captured it the best I could, but I did gasp out loud by myself <laughs> a few times at, during the movie in a way that I didn't expect to, given just how old it is and how um, crude, relatively speaking, the effects were. Well, I mean, I think... The the ability of Jaws to til- still kind of scare you and build that suspense speaks to the power of, like, practical movie effects. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is one of the things that I think Jurassic Park does really well. And one of the reasons why that movie ages so well is that there's a really good blend of practical effects and really top-notch, especially for the time, computer animation. But there's this physicality to, like, having an animatronic shark biting the bottom of the boat as opposed to relying on computer graphics for everything. I mean, it was more than that here. It was the music, and it was the camera angles. Um, I mean, it is, to be clear, an expertly directed film yeah. from top to bottom. I started to have a Pavlovian response every time I heard the theme music. Dun, dun. It's like, oh, shit, dun, what now? <laughs> so you realize we're going to play that just around the office around you now, right? Um, we're going to get them to play it over the speakers at 5.30. Yep. <laughs> Just so everybody That's knows, not gonna go well. at 5.30 in the afternoon at the office, they play music over the loudspeakers for some reason that we can't quite figure out, nor do we know who has control over it. I actually do know. Oh, do you know? Yeah. Are we allowed to can you, I'm gonna, can you I'm share gonna, that information? I'm going to request the Jaws theme <laughs> I'm going to file a FOIA request to you so I can find out who I have to talk to about this. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad you, you watch it. You finally now also understand the... We're going to need a bigger boat reference. They never got a bigger boat. <laughs> <laughs> Idiots. Wait, would that have changed anything? Because I don't know how this movie ends. <laughs> Probably. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, okay, so you need to watch. Um, you should watch Crystal Jaws. Skull. And then. E.T. Okay. Start with E.T. Just watch E.T. Okay. What am I watching next? That is a good question. So... We've given you a pair of Spielberg films at this point, kind of yes. like monster movies. Um, Jaws really being a perfect kind of genre film. Um, I don't know. See, this is the thing. We should have had this conversation before we came on, and we did not. Have you seen... You've seen all the Indiana Jones movies. Let's move away from Spielberg, though. Should we give her something like arty and weird? Well, Should so we go pop culture? Here's my question. Are you exclusively trying to give Dana good things to watch? Um, or is like, yes. Or is like so bad it's good also possible? I mean, if it's a um, really like a cultural touchstone kind of thing, huh. so bad it's good. Huh. Give me like good I, stuff. Like I'd say like Plan 9 from Outer Space is like a cultural touchstone. Sure. Um, but I, it's also a terrible movie. I was going to throw out Troll 2, which is objectively awful, but the greatest, the greatest film I've ever seen <laughs> in my life. Troll 2 oh, is amazing. Oh, so good. But here's what I'd say is if you watch Troll 2, you also need to watch the documentary The Best Worst Movie. Yes, in, uh, which, in which the mom, it's revealed, 
kind of went a little crazy. Yeah. After this movie. Um, I don't know. Are you, fe- are you feeling something super dumb and ridiculous, but also like a sort of cult classic thing? Um, no. <laughs> well, let's, let's go cult classic. Have you seen Rocky Horror Picture Show? Yes. Okay. So that's okay. Not that I'm necessarily a huge fan, but I was I got thinking it. cult classics. I watched Little Shop of Horrors. Wait, you you've never watched... seen Little Shop of Horrors? Okay, there we go. That's Dana's homework is watch Little Shop of Horrors. I'm going to give you extra credit homework, though. No. Yes. No. Can we film you singing it using the new Clips app <laughs> no. that I've used <laughs> to capture you talking about your baked ziti, um, which isn't a thing. For extra credit after you watch the movie, find the original ending and watch that as well. Uh, easily found on YouTube, but watch the original ending, which is uh, the ending from the play, but they decided it was too dark for the film, and so they changed it. The original ending, I argue, is a much better way to have gone. So, Can I clarify something? Were there not two? Like, wasn't there another earlier Little Shop of Horrors with, like, Jack Nicholson in it? Yes. Which is also very good. But, but that's not what we're going to That's not at. what we're watching. That is not, that is not the cultural touchstone. <laughs> it's a very good movie, but it is not uh, right, Rick fine, Moranis. Fine, fine. So, yeah. Go watch Little Shop of Horrors for next week. Dig up the original ending on YouTube. Uh, we will reconvene next week to discuss it. Uh, any last thoughts before we close this one out? Nope. No? All Dana, right. how, was, how was your dinner? It was great. Yeah? Cooked it myself. Big ziti with bits of chicken sausage and mozzarella sprinkled in. I don't know why I've memorized that, but it's, it's lodged in there, unfortunately. <laughs> she hasn't brought in uh, scones again yet. It hasn't brought in anything in a while, actually. You have to make scones. All right, we need to wrap this up yeah, and right. browbeat Dana <laughs> into making and scones. And Dana needs to go back to the kitchen, I yeah. know. Uh, Dana, where can the fine people find you on the internet? I am at Dana Wolman on Twitter, and as you can see, sometimes I rant about movies I am in the process of watching. Chris? Hey, you can find me on Twitter at Chris Velasco. Velasco spelled V as in Victor, E-L-A-Z as in Zebra, C-O. That's pretty good. I like that. I've, my entire life I've been doing that. <laughs> I am at Terrence O'Brien, lots of E's, no A's. Please uh, send us your feedback, your criticisms, your questions, whatever. We want to hear from you guys. Uh, you can also hit up uh, the podcast on Twitter. It's at Engadget Podcast, or you can email us at podcast at Engadget.com. Uh, we will be ne- back next week. In the meantime, subscribe, rate, do a thing in Live your long, podcast. Prosper. Yeah, do that. All right, let's go. <laughs>